number four, Wells Fargo Bank versus Ferrado. Good afternoon, Council. Good afternoon. Um, may it please the court, Brian Pantaleo on behalf of Appellant Wells Fargo, I'd like to reserve three uh, minutes for rebuttal. You may have three minutes, sir. Thank you. Um, this appellant didn't slumber on its rights. Um, this appellant, through multiple actions, avidly tried to enforce its rights um, and protect its security interest in the mortgage. Um, but the ground kind of moved underneath it. Um, having to file all of these actions. Um, whether it was at first um, just the inconsistent positions in the earlier actions that a uh, respondent takes now, whether it was the law of revocation kind of being undone, um, and all of a sudden the court started looking at uh, pretext, which was not a requirement before. They started looking at um, what the intent, like a mens rea almost, as to what the lender is thinking when they're invoking a contractual right, a contractual right that this court had recognized for over 100 years, um, or whether it was the strategy employed by respondent to push this case further and further and further until we actually had a statute of limitations issue. Um, with the re respect to the first part, the, the earlier actions, the 2009 and the 2011 actions, um, the Supreme Court in the 2011 action made a clear distinction. Um, it divided the, the case into two, or divided the, the mortgage instruments into two. It said that there is a separate um, uh, instrument, um, the mortgage alone, and it's a separate instrument, the mortgage with a modification. And foreclosure upon one is not foreclosure upon the other. It, it said um, it's not, uh, it, they're not permitted to foreclose on whatever um, they choose or wh whichever mortgage instrument they choose. And that was a very, very important distinction. And that distinction came after Ferrato argued um, to that court that these were two separate agreements, that, um, that they were suing under the wrong agreement, Wells Fargo was, that the agreement was renegotiated, that the uh, mortgage was amended and served. If I may ask a question. Judge Rivera. So, so uh, counsel, if I'm understanding your argument, given the position uh, taken uh, in a prior action, um, your position is that the lender can proceed under the original agreement or under the modification. Am I understanding you correctly? Uh, that was not the Supreme Court's position. That was the no, position no, I'm asking, that was taken. I'm asking you about the lender's position. Um, so this lender's position is um, essentially that's what we had to deal with because that's what the Supreme Court said. Um, I have seen no appellate law that actually supports that case. Um, but that's what we relied upon, and that's what the court found, because that's what Ferrato argued. Did, did, did in the earlier actions, weren't you proceeding on uh, the agreement that predates the modification, that is to say the original agreement? Well, that's what the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court didn't think that way. The Supreme Court said these are two separate actions. And no, I'm asking you what the lender was proceeding on. I'm asking you. Okay, well, okay, so it, the lender did not reference the modification. Okay. Um, and the so lender is then proceeding under the first agreement because you're not mentioning the second one, right? Um, what the court, yeah, right. The court said that there were two separate, the Supreme Court said that there were two separate agreements. So it uh, yes. determined that they're proceeding on the fourth, the first agreement. Yes. So, or the, the and, wrong agreement. And if, as that is what, if that is what the lender is doing, how does that encourage debtors and lenders to enter modifications? They're proceeding on the wrong agreement. How does that encourage okay, them? Okay, so you're conceding now that that would have been the wrong agreement. Um, no, I'm just conceding that that's what the court said. Again, let me try it this way. What is the agreement the lender was proceeding under? The mortgage. The, first, <laughs> the mortgage. There's a modification, is there not? Yes, there's also a modification. Okay. So does, what, what impact, if any, let me try it this way, does the modification have on the action? On the well, 
in, in, in this case, they weren't allowed to introduce it. It, it was dismissed. The complaint couldn't go forward. Um, they wouldn't, there was no uh, answer or affirmative defense. Modification and reformation are affirmative defenses. Uh, the court didn't even let it get to that stage. The court said this complaint just can't, can't be moved forward. We, we, we can't go anywhere with this. Um, these are two separate and distinct instruments. And it didn't grant leave to amend. Um, almost by that reasoning, it couldn't have granted leave to amend because it said you didn't have the right instrument when you filed. Um, now, again, this is not, you know, th this was this was what became the law the lender, of the case. So couldn't the lender file the next day under the correct instrument as the court saw it? Well, th that's what the court did. The, 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 or that's what the lender did. The lender went back and, and attempted to at, file. At what point? With, How many proceedings before the lender went back under the modification? The next proceeding. The next proceeding, which was the 2011 case, this was dismissed in, in 2010, but you can't, there's all kinds of notice requirements to, to file a foreclosure. Um, so this, this was something very distinct. And um, the court was, um, with 2017 action, the, the order that's actually on appeal, when the Supreme Court looked at this order, um, it understood this in terms of the option contract jurisprudence that had developed in the appellate departments. Burke and its prodigy. And basically, if you have the wrong plaintiff and you don't have standing or you're not a note holder at that point in time, um, then you can't accelerate the loan. And that, that complaint is insufficient to do so. Well, here you have a situation where you have the wrong document, the wrong document said by the court. So you don't have standing or, or you may or may not have standing. We don't know because it's, it's actually the wrong document. Um, and you can't proceed. Again, the, that, that complaint, because it was the wrong instrument, could not have accelerated the right loan. Chief um, Judge, so may speak. I ask, may I inquire? Judge Stein. Counsel, are you aware of any other reported cases that involve this situation where um, the court said that the, um, that the lender was suing on the wrong instrument as between an original mortgage and a modification? I do not. Um, there are there is some case law out there that says if you reference the modification, you can later introduce it into evidence. It's more recent case law. I think it's out of the second department. Um, but as far as a court saying, no, this is we, we, we were not going to accept this complaint at the motion to dismiss stage without even an answer. Um, you know, th that, that's about it. And, and you're arguing that um, the court uh, improperly denied um, your request to recognize uh, an effective revocation with regard to pri the prior actions, right? When, when do you say that revocation was effective? When did that take place? Was it um, when you made the motion in Supreme Court in August 2017, or was it um, at the time of the Supreme Court order in March of 2018? Uh, it was at the time. So we, we've spoken for a long time and we've had um, four cases or three cases before this that talk about a clear and unequivocal act. The clear and unequivocal act is when a lender's attorney puts in an aff affirmation, the basis of this motion is to revoke acceleration. That's, that's recorded, that's true to the world, everybody can see it. And that's at the point in time that, that everybody should know. Um, and um, the court just started to look, uh, this was even before Malone, but this, this was the first Supreme Court opinion that I'm aware of, um, where the court looked at this and said, no, you can't revoke um, in its order. We're, we're gonna accept that you're discontinuing, but you in capital letters cannot revoke. Um, so uh, again, uh, our position is that pretext really shouldn't matter. Um, all that matters is that clear and unequivocal act. And here you have it in August of 2017. Chief, if Thank I'm you, uh, if, Yes, Judge Wilson. So counsel, um, I didn't see any rationale as to why why the court, so the Supreme Court said you can't revoke. Was there any oral discussion that would shed any light on that, what, what the reasoning was? I, I was not uh, present. Uh, at the oral argument, but I, I do not understand. I believe the argument was, hey, they just want to revoke because they're gonna avoid the statute of limitations. And um, uh, again, our position is pretext really shouldn't matter here. 
uh, as you have a clear and unequivocal act. It's like any other contractual right, and this is a contractual right that's been recognized for 100 years by this very court. Thank you, counsel. Counsel? Good afternoon. Uh, may it please the court, Catherine Sherman for respondent Donna Ferrato. Um, as an initial matter, the, the facts of this case, which I'm sure the court is, is very familiar with, um, are slightly different from those that you've heard in the prior cases. Um, the bank in this case tried to foreclose upon Donna, Mrs. Ferrato, five times, um, starting in 2008 and the last time being in 2017. Over these 10 years, the bank could not get it right. The first action that they filed, um, the first action that was filed actually was settled with the lo loan modification agreement. Ms. Ferrato concedes that that modification agreement was a revocation of the initial acceleration of the loan. However, again, in September, 2009, the bank filed a second foreclosure action demanding that the entire debt be paid. Accordingly, they accelerated the loan in September 2009. May I inquire? Yes, of yes, course. Your Honor. Counsel, um, I'm a little confused. <laughs> um, you sought dismissal of the earlier actions because they sued on the wrong instrument. And I assume by that you meant you can't tell from the complaint what they were, what amount they were requesting, or if you could, it was the wrong amount. So how does that constitute an unequivocal overt act of um, acceleration if that is true? Well, Your Honor, there, there was one mortgage here and one piece of property that Ms. Ferrato had a mortgage on with the bank. And in fact, both the second and third foreclosure actions, although they did not attach the modification agreement or refer to the modification agreement in Schedule E attached to both of those complaints, they had the correct principal amount due under the loan modification agreement. Well, but they, they didn't, they, they, by referring to the mortgage, that would indicate one amount due, and by attaching Schedule E, that would refer to a different amount due. Um, to me, that's the quintessential <laughs> equivocal act. Well, it was clear that the bank was demanding that Ms. Ferrato pay the full amount of her loan or her house would be taken away from her. And, you know, the loan modification agreement in and of itself refers back to the mortgage and the note. And there was no indication for Ms. Ferrato that she wasn't going to lose her home if she didn't pay the full amount due. Now, there's a difference between the standard of stating a claim for foreclosure, which is what we argued the bank failed to do, and a difference between what constitutes clear and unequivocal notice that the loan is being accelerated. And Chief, if I might ask a question there. So, so when you said uh, failure to state a claim, why did the complaint fail to state a claim? Was it because it was not the right mortgage instrument that was sued on? It was incomplete mortgage documents. And so and, it did so that, it affects, did. that affects what? Why is that? Why is that? Why is the Supreme Court's decision correct? Well, Judge Kenny decided in the third action, and essentially because the bank had no um, rebuttal to our argument that it didn't state a claim because it's incomplete mortgage documents. And, you know, in, in a residential foreclosure, the bank is held to specific standards of what needs to be included in the summons and complaint to foreclose upon the, the borrower. And here, the bank just on a technical error didn't include all of the mortgage documents. But at no point did Ms. Ferrato understand that the bank was going to continue to accept payments from her, or at no point did they uh, indicate that they were not accelerating the entire mortgage that was due, the loan. So it is our position that the loan was indeed accelerated by the commencement of the second foreclosure action. Um, going to the court's second issue that I believe it's been discussing all day regarding whether or not a voluntary discontinuance constitutes um, a revocation of the acceleration. Um, not to uh, <laughs> cut down my uh, colleagues who argued this point previously, but actually in this case, it doesn't matter. 
if this court decides that a voluntarily discontinued action automatically revokes the acceleration, then it doesn't matter to Ms. Ferrato because the bank started a third foreclosure action in September 2011, two years after it commenced the second action with the wrong document attached and failed in that case was dismissed on the merits by the court. So if you count from this third action, then the fifth action filed in December 2017 is still time barred. So that particular issue that's before the court today is not relevant in the facts of the case that is Mrs. Ferrato's. Um, you know, just to sum up, I would say Ms. Ferrato has been, been dealing with the bank with this for over 10 years now. Um, it, it's, it's really disingenuous for the bank to come forward now and to suggest that Ms. Ferrato had some grand scheme to, uh, you know, to trick the bank in some way. It was the bank's repeated failures and incompetence to pursue the foreclosure in the correct legal manner that has gotten them in the position that they are now. And they've run out of time. Thank you, counsel. Counsel? Thank you, may I please the court. Um, this was not a technicality. Um, and this idea that this was the wrong mortgage interest and the complaint could not proceed um, came after, again, arguments made by Ferrato and her counsel that they were suing under the wrong instrument, that the mortgage was amended and superseded, not wrong documents. The mortgage was amended and superseded um, by a later agreement con containing um, substantially different terms, that the documents upon which the complaint relied upon were incorrect and more importantly of no force and effect um, and that's that's why they didn't accelerate the loan and if that was the case in 2011 oh, that was the case in 2009 as well i'm sorry counsel no that's fine um so counsel but i i think her point is that as you started saying over and over you are indeed uh trying to get paid all she is saying is that, yes, over and over, you're trying to get paid the full amount, that that was always what, what the lender was pursuing, even if, I won't use her terminology, even if each time there's a reason that the court stops them in their tracks, that what the message that they communicated, what they made clear, their, their action was, we want the full debt paid we're calling the debt why isn't she right about that that that's what one draws from this record if you look at indeed what the lender did um because again it was a different document and a different set of loan instruments and if that was true then that action should have been able to proceed um at in 2011 it's as simple well, as but that there is, we didn't mean, you, we didn't want to file five actions interrupt. do you then uh, take the position that the only way that you can accelerate is by a an action that is maintained at the court? That if you make some technical error and it's dismissed that you haven't attempted to accelerate? Um, we take the position that this is not a technical error nor a technical decision, that this was a substantive if, if um, the error. Court dis if the court disagrees with you, do you lose? If the I'm sorry, with the if court, the court disagrees and and uh, sees it her way about the nature of this error, do you lose? Um, no, because if you look at option contract jurisprudence, um, there is an option, and you have to provide notice as to the option that you're accelerating from the correct document. Um, there are different interest rates. Um, there are different um amount. There are different amounts. Um, under the different document. And that is not clear that 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 is like Justice Science said, that's as unequivocal as you can get when you're looking at two different amounts and you have quote unquote, the wrong document um, as the Supreme Court found in 2011 and Ferrato argued um, vociferously to the to the court at that point in time. Thank you. Thank you, counsel.